Uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, we're very um, pleased to have Tyler Brule with us, a very popular guest here at the FCC. Um, uh, just a couple of announcements quickly. Uh, please do silence your phones. And um, as you may have noticed, it's been a very busy month here at the FCC with our lunch and other events, and we have a lot more to come. So please do take a moment at some point to uh, check those out on the website or in your emails. Um, one event that I wanted to highlight today is um, on March next week. Uh, we should. Uh, this will be April third. Uh, we'll have a club screening of Battle Box, which is the final film in the Battle of Hong Kong World War II trilogy, and those films have always been um, really good. So uh, please do think about that one, and. Yeah, um, otherwise let's get right to it. Um, so I, uh, I don't think Tyler needs much of an introduction. Um, many of you have been reading his, met, read his longtime column in the Financial Times. He is also the editor in chief of Monocle and was also uh, the founder of Wallpaper in 1996. Um, so he has um, a lot to tell us today about Monocle and what the, uh, the direction it's heading in, as well as um, thoughts on a number of other things that we're going to get to. So um, I will turn it over to you. Super. Thank you very um, much. Thank you. Um, first, um, I think just um, a big thanks to, uh, to Tim, um, because he was the one who, uh, who roped me in. Uh, to being here today. It was my first trip back about five weeks ago, um, so really uh, delighted to be back. Uh, and we did a little cocktail uh, over uh, at our space uh, in Wan Chai. Uh, and it was that point he said it would, be, it would be wonderful to have a little bit of a discussion, a bit of a revisit uh, to where we were many years ago, um, of course, when we were in this space, having an active discussion um, about, about journalism. Um, Jennifer, we had, a, we had a good chat, of course, uh, last week. And I guess there's a couple of themes um, I want to go through. I don't want to take you through um, a, a labored presentation, but maybe just more of an update. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you were here last time uh, when we've been doing things. Uh, in a way, not much of the story has changed, but tons has changed um, as well. And I'd love to use the session today to, to really turn this into a dialogue. So I'm not going to uh, bang on too long. Um, and in the spirit of... Um, good journalism, um, we, we love a bit of competition. So I have three prizes um, as well. So um, I've got my pen and paper ready. Uh, so I will be taking names when we do questions from the audience uh, and everyone, well, not everyone, but the three best questions um, are gonna get uh, a treat. Um, just maybe a bit of, um, just setting the stage a little bit. Um, I'm Canadian uh, and you only lose your accent if you want, um, if you've been in the UK for, for 30 years. Uh, started my career um, with the BBC uh, as, as a journalist in broadcasting. Um, and then over the years, uh, moved more to radio and more to, more to print. Um, and as Jennifer said at the, at the outset, um, launched a series of magazines. And now, and maybe this is sort of one of, one of the updates, um, I think uh, some of us are still living through uh, the effects of Brexit. And um, we, we've always, we're a family structure as a company, so we, um, we have a holding company uh, which sits uh, in, in Zurich. Uh, we've been there for the last two decades. And we always had an office there which was you know, partly a holding company office. There was sometimes one or two correspondents that were based there, um, maybe one or two finance people. But as you know, a number of things happened, uh, of course, um, in, in the UK, uh, Brexit being front and center, we, we really had to think about our logistics. We had to think about printing. How are we going to get a magazine around the world? Uh, Monocle is actively sold. You know, you'll find us on newsstand still in over 50 countries, but we print in one place. So once upon a time, um, going into, uh, you know, from the start in 2007, we were printing down in Cornwall, very good, uh, you know, great printers. Uh, but overnight, we knew there was going to be a challenge in terms of getting the magazine um, out there uh, around the world. So we moved uh, our printing, um, all of our distribution to newsstand, all of our subscription service, everything moved um, to Germany. Uh, and, and at about the same time as well, we thought, we have this space um, in, in Zurich, and, and we were also looking at a little bit not just how we were doing news gathering, but also we were looking at you know, the big part of what we do. If you sort of look at 
the pie and where do we make, uh, where, where do we make our money as, as a brand, 60% comes from advertising um, and, and our partnerships. Uh, so that's you know, a big chunk of what we do. Um, the other 20% uh, is, is driven by, uh, of course, newsstand um, and subscriptions. And then the other 20% largely is, is retail. So if I look back maybe five, or five years ago, retail was 8%. It's now 20% of what we do. So that is you know, Harry and colleagues over in Wan Chai. Um, it's, it's our team up in Tokyo. Um, and now it's, um, it's 12 shops and cafes around the world. And these are an incredible point of engagement um, for us. So we started looking at that. We started looking at actually where does the magazine make money? And so we have about 100 journalists and, uh, and commercial colleagues sitting in London. Um, and that's getting the magazine out. That's doing our books. It's running the radio service. It's doing digital, et cetera. But if you look at the UK, it's our second most important market in the world after the US, but it doesn't rank in the top 10 in terms of revenue. Uh, and we looked at actually where are, we, where are we making money around the world, and Switzerland, in a way, is our headquarters home market, um, was also the biggest market in terms of revenue and continues to be, so neck and neck with France. And uh, so we, we said maybe we should, um, not quite up sticks, but we should put a bit more of a commercial and, and editorial focus um, out of Zurich. And, and so that was uh, five years ago. And then we sort of get to the period of, of the pandemic. And that was one of the interesting things about being in a market which was so dynamic. Um, and you think about how these small countries um, you know, have to function and make their way in the world. And I would say after Sweden, probably um, Switzerland was the most relaxed place um, in, in Europe. So there were, there were no travel restrictions. Uh, there were, you know, it was quite mask light. Of course, it was not like Italy or, or Spain. There were, no, there were never masks outside. You could have dinner parties. Uh, you could you know, pretty much do what you want. They annoyed their neighbors. Uh, of course, Austria, Germany, uh, France, and Italy by keeping the ski slopes open, of course, which became um, a huge story uh, within Europe. So that was also, I think, you know, in, this, in these last three years, to be in a country which was wanted to do business, um, and wanted to be engaged with the world and be open, it gave us a certain sense of dynamism as well in terms of where we could travel um, and, and also bringing people back without, I would say, the sort of heavy-handed quarantines, et cetera. And I, I know I'm speaking within a specific market um, in the world when it comes to quarantines. Um, that also, it was, we were so happy that we were able to, um, to, make, to make that choice. So that's sort of, in a nutshell, um, how we function. The world, for us, as we see it, about 50% of our readership is Europe, um, and, and then we're pretty much, yeah, 25% North America, 25% Asia, but still the US is our single biggest market within Europe, um, UK, then it goes Germany, um, and, and then it sort of, it becomes quite evenly split, I would say sort of numbers, um, four across to 10. Um, I'm just gonna just maybe just, um, one thing you and I were talking about was, was I guess, the, the power and importance of getting out there, and I guess that's why it was so, um, yeah, it was just so important for us to be able to use Zurich as a springboard as much as possible to both reposition journalists as well, um, and not just like, from the business of doing your story, but I think, as many of us will know, also from a mental health perspective. Um, it was interesting sometimes seeing our colleagues arrive from London and, and just, you know, where things were so difficult. And you, as you know, you couldn't sit on a park bench, you couldn't do anything, um, and then you came into a country, and I think that's one of the fascinating things about, um, about Switzerland, and I had an Australian friend visiting recently, and she said, it's so amazing that you're in, you know, uh, of course, a very evolved economy, as evolved as Australia, but she gets a country without rules, where she said, you know, in Australia, you know, you need to wear a high-vis vest to go out the front door, you need to wear a helmet to do anything in Australia. Um, and, and Switzerland is the, is the opposite side, it's about self-responsibility, um, and that you, you put trust in the individual, and that was very much also how the pandemic was governed. Uh, and, and so I think it was quite stark when you come maybe from an Anglo-Saxon market where there is a bit of a nanny state. Um, but it was, it was something which was a, was a great um, enabler for us. So I guess a little bit we were talking about the need to be out there, the need to be present. I was chatting to Tim about, uh, about this, which maybe a little bit sort of prompted. And, and Jennifer and I were chatting, it, chatting about it um, as well uh, just before we came up here 
we were very, very, I would say, not just big on, but I would say quite forceful about making sure that almost throughout the pandemic, people were in the office. So even if you come to our offices in London right now, um, it, I think we could sell tickets sometimes because it's a bit of a, like a zoo because people sort of think, wow, it's like sort of people are at desks um, and they're in the office all day and, and, and everything is full and buzzing and, and lively. And this is what um, an office looks like. So uh, we are unapologetic about the fact that uh, we want people at work, we, we, need to, we need to look up at the wall when we look at the magazine um, and we need to interrogate how does you know, the cover you know, interact with the front of the book. You know, we look at a bigger story at the back, does that need to be on the front cover? Yes, I mean, can you do it maybe um, on a screen that big and we can all be on a call? Yes, I mean, it is possible. Um, are you going to get the same result? No, um, and I think that has been absolutely uh, essential for us. And um, so we didn't have, I would say, much trouble in sort of rallying everybody, that belief that you know, we talk about newsrooms um, and, and that is, that's, the, that's the dynamism of a great newsroom. And I think it's, it's interesting, you see so many other industries today try to ape the newsroom and that's because a, a good newsroom, it's, it's intuitive. Um, I can see someone's frown across the room uh, I can see someone reacting to something on the other side. You're able to sort of read the dynamism of, of, of that place. And, and so we're very um, strong believers in that. And, and that is why we've, we've pushed forward, making sure that uh, people are in the office. Now, of course, behind all of that, I would say that we were always a company. I don't want to listen to someone banging on um, on a conference call um, you know, with headphones on on the other side of the office. If you need to do that, we've always been of the view, go do that at home. Um, and if you need to focus because you're writing a, a 3,000 word feature, then of course do that from, from home as well. And also we're out on the road. Um, but I think the idea of, of that, it's sort of a given uh, that it's a bit of a free for all that you can do whatever you want and set your own rules um, it has not been how we've been, um, we've been functioning. I guess since we, we all met last time, um, maybe just a, a few little um, updates. So one thing we did just going um, almost into the pandemic, we, we were listening to our, our female audience a lot at events like this. So I would say sort of active purchase, our audience, we would look at subscribers, people buying on newsstand, it's around 70% male. Um, but of course, I would say we're pr pretty evenly split in terms of you know, total readership. Um, but there was still room to, um, to do this. So we have not been pumping this out in Asia. You'll find it in, in Sutaya. Uh, of course, you will find it um, uh, you know, via Harry. You'll find it at specialist newsstands in Asia. But our, our focus with Confect, you know, very much sort of building on um, the, the, the German word of something which is very special. Confection is also ready to wear. Um, and this is something which had its spiritual start in Zurich. So it's co-edited between Switzerland um, and the UK. It's four times a year. Um, it is unapologetic as well about being uh, aimed at women over 35. Uh, we're not trying to, to chase you know, a generation of 21-year-old TikTokers. That's not our market. Um, and what's been interesting is that you know, where there was, it's found about $1.5 million in revenue just in advertising alone that wasn't there before. Um, and, and as I said, we do it four times a year. Sophie Grove is the editor-in-chief. Uh, she also sits as one of the executive editors on Monocle as well. She was one of our, our former foreign editors. So she comes from a very gritty uh, background as a foreign correspondent, ex-Newsweek, with Stryker McGuire's uh, assistant. Uh, so she's had a, you know, really a wonderful journalistic upbringing and is now overseeing that. Um, airports are important. We know that the newsstand, sadly, is dying in so many parts of, of the world. Um, so we've been looking at pop-up projects, um, and this was something that uh, we'll be doing elsewhere, but just how do you engage people? How do you engage with a, a global travel, traveling audience? Um, the other thing is, probably since I saw you last, we used to have a publishing business with Gestalten in Germany, uh, which we've, we've stopped that. It was a traditional, I would say, publishing business. They would pay us in advance. Uh, we would do a book. We would get royalties. Now we work with, uh, with Thames and Hudson, and we finance the books fully. Thames and Hudson do does the sales and distribution for us. Um, so it just allows us to be much more agile. Obviously, we, we, we derive bigger returns from it. So um, Portugal, this is a new franchise we're doing called the Handbook Series. We started with Portugal. Spain just came out, so I'm, I'm on my way from Dubai. We, we launched or had our second part of our, our, our rollout for the book there. 
And it's a little, it's, it's changing the notion, and you'll, we have copies over there. You'll see it's, it's not just, okay, great places uh, to go on holiday and where would you want to spend your time in Madrid. It also plays in that fantasy, I think, when we're traveling a little bit, that notion of, okay, you know, actually, I'd like to, I would like to sort of buy a place in Cadiz. And if I bought a place, who would my architect be? So it's also a little bit playing into the world of, of where people are relocating into, into sunnier places. Um, speaking of Spain, we just did a great uh, reportage in Melilla. So just, I think, looking at, at, at the notion of colony still, um, and, of, and of course, focus on Melilla versus Ceuta, but, um, and really telling a Mediterranean story. Uh, of course, you know, Europe with a foothold in Africa. What does this mean uh, from a migration, from a, pol a policy perspective? What does this mean in terms of, of, of relationships between Spain and France? But just a commitment to getting out there, doing great uh, reportage. Um, events have become increasingly important. We do big city conferences. Our quality of life conference is, is really a set piece where we look at what makes cities succeed and fail. Took that to Paris last year. If anyone is you know, heading to Paris over the coming uh, days, weeks, months, I would really advise you, this is the space we held it in. It's called 19M. And, and this is, it's owned by Chanel. Um, and it's where Chanel has, they put all of, many of their ateliers that they own under one roof. Um, so whether it's Maison Michel who makes their hats for them, et cetera, it's taking the notion of what was the atelier um, and, and putting it on in, a, I would say, a rather edgy part of, of Paris as well. And how do you create a new culture of craftsmanship? Um, so you know, we know that the world is not going to be about necessarily writing code the whole time. Um, you also might want to you know, learn how to, uh, of course, form felt uh, and, and make a great hat, or to become a jeweler, et cetera. And um, really a, a remarkable, remarkable space. Um, expanded our correspondent network. Um, we've been spending a lot of time you know, with big leadership. So we were with Jokowi recently um, in, in Indonesia. Um, I think one thing we've noticed is just, again, being out there, I think, trying to find that which is unexpected. And, and this is one of my favorite stories um, that Natalie, our, our fashion editor, did. She went to Pontevedra. So Pontevedra is, 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 is in Galicia, um, but it probably has one of the most interesting fashion schools, uh, certainly in the world at the moment. And part of it is because it's just down the street from the global headquarters of Inditex, and Inditex, of course, being the parent company of Zara. Um, and so it's, you know, here you have a very, very small ecosystem in an almost forgotten corner of Europe, but just a great generation of design talent um, coming out of there. I think one thing we've noticed, um, and I'm sure you feel it in Hong Kong, you've been feeling it for a long time, but maybe this, you know, oftentimes I feel like sitting in Zurich, the continent moves a little bit further away from the UK. It moves further away from the United States. Um, and and somehow, I, you start to notice when you're not in an English-speaking environment every day that there is a there's an Anglo narrative of, of, how, of how we, and I say this as a Canadian, how we as, as Canadians and Australians and Americans see the world, a little bit the five eyes, and how everyone else sees it. And I think we try not to forget uh, that there is a Swiss pragmatism or a Germanic pragmatism or a French chauvinism, uh, you know, which is part of the cultural currency. So I think we, one thing we have set out to do a little bit more is just, is just query, I think, the prevailing story. So our March issue is very much questioning an e-future. Um, you know, I think where a lot of, of course, so much media just, we have to follow a sustainability story. And of course it's important, but what is the reality, you know, if you are a big service station business in Iowa? You know, what is really happening? You know, I just came from Dubai, and uh, yeah, do you see Teslas in, in Dubai? One or two. Uh, do you see thousands upon thousands of, of Range Rovers and Nissan patrols and lineups for people to buy them, uh, which I don't think that there's you know, any non-diesel coming out anytime soon? No, um, you know, that, is, that is what's driving off the lot. So it's also a little bit, I think, trying to sort of query, turn things on their head a little bit. We've been in the Ukraine a lot, so multiple missions out there. We've been putting a lot of our journalists through hostile environment training. Um, very good program as well. Any journalists here, I can, again, we oftentimes go with the Americans, you go with the Brits, but the Scandinavians uh, run a very, very good program um, out of both Denmark and Norway, so we've been sending our correspondents there. Now, this is a, a little project. I think we might have um, some of these over here. We, we've been, you know, again, 
and I'll just sort of share a bit of information. People say, you know, where does the where does the business make money? God, you talk a lot about paper. Well, here's a little fact. Last year was a record year for us for our business, and profitability and growth was all about paper. Radio station, nice to have. Digital newsletters, great. Website, fine. But when I look at actually what really puts us in the black as a business, it's print. So this is a, a project. Rolex came to us. Rolex said we wanted, their, you know, their, their big advertiser. They said we want to do something different. We want people to just be out next summer. This, this, this is a project that came about last July. And we just want, we, you know, we, we want them to engage and, 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 and experience media in a different way. So that was the challenge they set us. We went back with what is basically a paper book, and it was a paperback, and it's just a series of just great essays. And it's great essays about how to improve your life. And that might be, you know, being an advocate for, uh, you know, better urban policies in your city. Uh, it might be learning a craft, whatever it is, sold out. But you've got a book publishing model. Here's the interesting bit. You've got a book publishing model where someone has already paid you the advance, which you get to keep, and you're also able to go and sell this on top of it as well. So we did one with Rolex. We've just done one with uh, Siemens. We've done one with Lufthansa. Uh, and now we are, now Rolex liked it so much that we'll do another one. So we've got this sort of whole new world of, um, of other things that are going on. Um, before we go to your questions very quickly, a couple of things. Why am I here? Partly to be at the FCC, but Saturday, finally, you know, <laughs> we are able to reopen our shop at Hong Kong Airport. So I have a number of colleagues um, there now, you know, right beside uh, the, the cafe uh, lounges out when you get to the Y at the top, hang a right. Um, and, and it's great. So uh, we're there reactivating that space. It's been closed for three years. Um, and, and this is it's just exciting because we're able to not just sell our magazine, but you can buy Der Spiegel and The Economist and, and many other things um, as much as our products. So just amazing to be back in, in, um, in Hong Kong and, and doing that. Um, on Monday, Monocle 24, uh, which is our audio franchise, becomes Monocle Radio. Um, and that's just a lineup of all of our, uh, our on-air talent uh, as well. So new sound, um, and, and you won't hear it from day one, but partly why I came from Singapore and Bangkok, we're looking at just how do we do Asia better. How, you know, and I, I, anyone who is a listener, we're not great um, you know, in those sort of six hours when we're not in studio in London or the States. So we want to be better at, at broadcasting um, out of here. Uh, we're also going to be redesigning our newsletter. If anyone's in the States over the coming weeks, we're doing our first weekender at Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, and the weekender is basically the Monocle Dating Club. Um, it's, we sort of found we can do all these big conferences, but actually our readers just want to, to, to meet each other um, in a business, maybe a romantic context, I don't know. But we, we bring in good authors, but it's a very, very sort of light format. Um, and we're looking at bringing that uh, to, to Asia as well. Lots of newspapers coming up. Um, so again, we've gone from doing no newspapers. Now we do five or six newspapers. Is it foreshadowing? Um, maybe us doing a bigger newspaper project? We'll, we'll see. Um, uh, in June, we launch our new book, which is about, I said, it's beaches, bathing, bulges, boats, and bums. Um, and it's, it's just about the world of, of just swimming and bathing culture, um, mostly with a bit of a Mediterranean focus. OK, this is just a plug we're looking, we're looking to hire right now. So we're on the hunt for an ad and partnerships director in Asia. So uh, the post can be based here. It can be, it could be anywhere, um, but probably where we have a base. So we're, it could be Bangkok, it could be Singapore, here, or Tokyo. Um, we've been managing this from London, but it just makes no sense any longer. So we want someone who can have the deep relationships with the banks, with the airlines, with the tourism organizations, who can you know, really loves to sell, um, and, and also can develop also, you know, creative ideas in terms of content partnerships. So um, please, you, tb at monocle.com, uh, or, uh, or an at monocle.com, or COO, but we're, we're re really on the hunt as we want to build things up here. Um, Quality of Life Conference is coming up in, in Munich, um, which will be uh, end of, uh, beginning of, of September. In autumn, our next handbook uh, after Portugal and Spain is France, uh, so that's on the horizon. And then we have a digital overhaul that we want to do. Um, our website is, you know, is not great. The app for radio, I mean, falls off uh, the screen most days. Um, but we have a big question where to build it. I mean, so much, I would say, editorially in Europe right now is being done in Latvia, Estonia. It's being done um, in Poland. But we're also thinking, um, Jennifer, but is there a possibility to look at also doing our build um, in, in Asia um, as well? So 
that's in everything in a nutshell. There's prizes here, but um, you're the, uh, the quiz master. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Um, I'm just going to start with one question so we can get people competing for those prizes. Um, so you mentioned that print is doing really well. It drives revenue. And for years, of course, we've been hearing about the death of print. Why do you think uh, it's still holding on? And why do you think people are still looking for those print products? I, I think one thing that's happening is, it, it's, it's, of course, it's not great for, for everyone. Um, and, and I think we've seen you know, many, um, I think many retreat from the space where they yeah, to the point that they, they wanted to stay in the game, but they were just putting out an, an inferior product um, for legacy reasons. And then for those legacy reasons, it actually starts to damage the overall brand. Um, I don't want to sort of speak about your former employer, but if I look at the supplements that they put out internationally versus, let's say, what the Financial Times does, uh, it's a very, very different, it's a very, very different product. And, and I think that's where you see the FT playing to the strength of, you know, if I'm Audi or if I'm Genesis or if I'm Cathay, if I want to go into print, I want to be in a great environment because I can be obviously, you know, on a Samsung screen or I can be on an, on an Apple screen, but then you know, if I want to be there, I'll be there. But if I'm going to go into print, I want the real estate uh, of, of opening that big page. I want the production quality um, that goes with it. And I think sadly, sadly, one of the things we are seeing, of course, is that your print does become more of a, a luxury product, not just for luxury brands. It just becomes more expensive to, to purchase paper today, to get a title onto newsstand, to get it around the world. Um, you, know, you have to be of, of some means at this point. Uh, but you know, certainly also where we see, you know, the, the, I would say, the big revenue drivers, the luxury goods business, um, even financial services, a lot of them still want to, uh, to be in a paper and uh, print environment. Um, I think the other thing, too, is we see with, with I would say, pan-regional titles, so you know, whether it is an FT, whether it is you know, a Bloomberg, this idea of also being a one-stop shop that I can advertise just once and I'm able to get the whole world. So I'll pick you up whether you, know, whether you buy my title in San Diego um, or you pick it up in Taipei, it's the same thing. Um, and there, of course, there are economies that, um, that, go, that go with that. And you have to be passionate. I think, you know, if you go in, I think if you go into a meeting and you're saying, well, you know, we've got our printing, but yeah, we're doing all this digital stuff over here, well then you're just sort of, you know, I think putting this in the shade. Um, so I think you have to go in and be very confident about print and you have to be excited and celebrate it. And it's interesting on the, the piece about the, the companion, we were asked by Siemens and Siemens, this is like Siemens AI metaverse marketing team and you know so they said you come in because we want to work on content with you and develop an ad partnership and in the course of that discussion um you know we had podcasts and we had films and we had everything you know that you'd want in a digital buffet and uh and then we had the rolex version that we did of, of the of, of the companion and the head of marketing just picked it up and said this is the most modern thing i've ever seen it's a paperback, but um, great, and that and that became the project. There was actually almost no digital output with the team, which is talking about manufacturing in the metaverse, but they they wanted a piece of print. Now I have a sort of a cynical theory about that as well. I think also if you are in any number of companies and you know, it comes up for budget review time and you've got to justify your 2024 spend, when all of your colleagues are coming up, um, the chief technology officer wants money, um, and the, and, and the chief design officer and the CCO, and everyone is, everyone is sort of fighting for spend, and you come up there as the chief marketing officer, you're commoditized if you're only on a screen like this. But if you can actually pass something around the table um, and you actually manufactured something, um, I, I, there's, there's probably a good chance that you're going to uh, find that your budget was preserved or maybe even uh, bumped up a little bit. Um, all right, well, let's jump into questions, um, starting over here. Oh, and uh, please uh, identify yourself and your organization, if any. Hi, Tyler. I'm James Ross from RCHK Radio 3 and Asia Radio Concepts. I'm fascinated by your um, venture into radio and interested to know why you think that's a, a great opportunity going forward. Perhaps sometimes radio is seen as a, a sort of old-fashioned medium, uh, but you've obviously brought it up to date. And you know, what do you see uh, as the opportunity here in Asia? Sure. 
So I guess you know, we're now 10 years into the Monocle 24. Um, it's not an experiment any longer. Um, I guess the starting point for us was, you know, I, I love, you know, I, I, I loved or love uh, the world service. I would say more loved. Um, and I used to find when I would, you know, we'd already sort of built up the franchise of, of, of the Monocle brand a little bit. But when I was turning on the world service, I found it was, it was like there was this place called Europe on our doorstep and, and the world service was not doing it very well. Um, it wasn't doing business very well um, in a deep way. And so I thought there was a number of themes that we were doing in the magazine, which are quite interesting. A decade ago, of course, we were at the start of the, we were already into the slope of, of the podcast boom. Um, and I guess we could have done a series of podcasts uh, and, uh, and, and somehow just sort of push them out there. But I guess I'd spent enough time in broadcasting and I just, I like the discipline of live. You know, not every single show we do is live. But there is a live rigor uh, to it. And of course, there are many live shows across the day, and there are many that are recorded. Um, but I thought this, and, and what it did, as soon as we started that, um, it created a different metabolism in our own newsroom. That you went from being a monthly magazine that did specials to news on the hour um, and having to get a morning show out. And so it just upped the tempo of our, of our news gathering. And there's been times I think, why do we do this? And, and, and years where it's lost money, and years where it makes money. Um, and I guess, I guess the other side is we thought there was a, you know, how could you take a lot of what the World Service and, and many other um, global state broadcasters are doing, but also bring in international brands um, as, as advertisers. So, you know, the way we work with UBS, uh, the way we work with Audi, uh, now we're doing a big project with Allianz. So there's a number of, of ways that, and, and I guess we found over the years now, particularly now, so many companies want to be in an audio space. They want to sponsor them, they want to try something out. Um, and I guess that's why we've, uh, we've stuck to it. There's been many days that we think, oh my God, it's like this is such a faff, the whole thing. Um, why are we doing it? But Monday we relaunched with a whole new sound and new presenters. And, um, and now we're, it's not huge, but we're about 1.6 million shows either download or listen to live. But what's been interesting during, so the pandemic was interesting for us because what we saw when people were working from home and they maybe didn't want to listen to the neighbors outside or the din of the family in the background, we, got, we started getting all of these really lovely emails from people just saying, you've become my companion at home because I'm isolated, I'm working by myself, and I love listening to Andrew Muller, um, or I love listening to Nick Moniz, uh, and I love Emma Nelson, and, and people really had an attachment to these voices and personalities. Um, so that was also interesting. I think podcast, 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 but we've also just started to see a nice uptick that people really listen to radio in, in, a, live, in a live format. And, and we know it's got a, a, an amazing agility which print or, 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 or on screen or, or television simply, simply doesn't have. Uh, yeah, Genevieve. Hi, Genevieve, um, PR, GECO, and board director. Um, thank you, Tyler, it's great to see you. It's been years since Wallpaper, where we first met in London. Um, I'm fascinated to bring it back to Hong Kong a bit to get your take on how you see our lifestyle media here in Hong Kong. Um, when I arrived, I was stifled that there wasn't a supplement market. You know, where was my Sunday Times style to read in the bath? You know, where was my um, Telegraph magazine on a Saturday? And we don't really have that market and never have, although of course we have Post Magazine, which we appreciate from STMP. Um, and we read our international titles, T Magazine, FT, How to Spend It, etc. But for me, in a luxury lifestyle market, there really is not any supplement culture, and I really miss that. How do you read our market, and how do you see that opportunity? Oh, goodness, you must have been following me or um, shouting me yes, in, in an Asian city yesterday. Um, I, think there's a huge, I think there's a huge opportunity, because I think when you, know, when you speak to luxury brands, they have the ability to do something with tea, or they have the ability to do something um, you know, with the FT or with us, et cetera. But sometimes they're looking for something much more targeted. And they say, I really, I just, I want to focus on Indonesia and Singapore, and, and I'm trying to maybe build a bridge to Japan, whatever it is. And they know if they do something which is you know, totally global, there's going to be a lot of wastage around it. So in short, I think the opportunity is huge. Uh, I really do. I think there is, you, you know, just, you know, my, my colleague uh, Naomi is here. It, it's, and, and, and was here now based in, in, in Singapore, just the, the ASEAN story, everything's sort of happening south of here because you know, we were talking about you know, how sort of you know, China devours so much of the story, but you think of just the spend 
the, uh, the pluck that's, that's happening in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Indonesia at the moment, where is that? Who's covering it? The relationship with this uh, city as, uh, and territory as a hub is enormous. So um, I, I'm, I'm quite excited. I think there is room to do something. Um, and now what format is it? Is it, is it a quarterly? Um, does that serve the market though if I'm opening up a new, health, a new hotel brand? If it's quarterly, is it a bit late? You know, so I think you have to think about what, what would the rhythm of it be? And then how, how, does, it, you know, how does it reach the reader? And I, and I do believe, sure, you can do something which is great and has an app, et cetera, but I don't know, does anybody look at how to spend it online? I don't think so. Um, and I think they might agree. Um, so it's, I think, you're, talk, you know, you're talking about a print product, um, and then is it, do I experience it in the cafe lounge? Um, is it in my hotel room? Or does it, does it, you know, is it something else that comes with my, my South China Morning Post, or does it come with another newspaper? So, um, interesting. <laughs> uh, maybe watch this space, let's see. Um, yes. Dorothy Chen, um, thank you so much for your comments. And sorry, what was your name, I'm sorry. Dorothy Chen. Sorry. Um, I'm curious could, um, if you can share a bit more about your selection of partners. Um, the reason being increasingly we've seen um, certain cultural events being politicized. For instance, when the Hong Kong Ballet went to the US, um, some activists decided to run a campaign saying boycott it because they're supported by the government. And I understand that Brand Hong Kong has been a very um, good partner of Monaco in, in the past. and. Um, and in the future, for instance, if Brand Hong Kong come back, or if the Saudi government comes to you and say, can you help me um, do something about um, our country, um, what would you do? Like, do you have a criteria, or how do you make sure that whoever is partnering with you, or um, given that they're a huge source of your revenue, also meets with your own brand's positioning and objectives? Yeah, so huge question, ongoing debate. So Brand Hong Kong, being a good example, um, obviously, when th so we had a partnership on our new on our daily newsletter um, uh, with with Brand Hong Kong, uh, and and this was obviously um, th when things obviously got um, I think you know quite tense. Um, yeah, I guess we talked it was just 2020, 2021, um, and and there they were as 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 a partner telling the economic story and obviously thinking that they'd be out of this quite soon. And that, uh, we had to pull it. I mean, there was, we had, we had to pull that partnership and we had to have a conversation with them saying, you know, we can't, and you know, it's not good for them, it's not good for us to see that this is, you know, is brought to you by, by Brand Hong Kong and then down page, uh, we're writing a critical uh, article. So um, I think that's also then down to the client to, I think, have a very candid conversation with them. Um, Saudi Arabia, same thing, um, we have to, yeah, we have to sort of figure out, yes, we're in business some days. We have to look at, I would say, the community is, you know, are they on Bloomberg with what they're doing? Are they in the FT? If they are, is there safety in numbers uh, that, that other media is taking it? And, and sometimes we simply have to say no um, as well. So it's, um, it's, it's complicated, but I think that's where you have to just be agile and have that relationship with your client to say, you understand why we, why we can't run this right now. But great, a very good question. Uh, yes, over here. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Shaw, I write about architecture and design. Um, I'm intrigued by this comment you made about not being focused on the TikTok generation. So how do you marry this need for advertising with um, your readership being a more mature audience and you know, dare I say it, getting older by the day. Um, you know, look at the people around the room. None of us are the TikTok generation. So how do you, how do you marry that? Because as you get older, you typically become more discriminating about what you buy and how much you buy. So is there a conflict there? Um, I think we want to bring people along, um, but I think we want to bring them along on our own terms. Um, Obviously, advertisers and brands aren't coming to us to say, okay, what is Monocle or Convex TikTok channel? Um, they would be having a conversation uh, with someone who's good on that platform. Um, but I think, you know, it is, it is certainly, I, I would say, thinking about I said, the digital overhaul that we want to do, part of it is that. How do you engage, I think, better on the screen? But how do you do it on your, your own terms? Um, you, know, you know, I always say, people say, why aren't you bigger on Instagram? And, and my view is, 
Instagram is great if you've got a hair salon, um, you know, over in, over in Kowloon and you want to promote it and you've got you know, an amazing team of stylists, et cetera. If you're a media brand, if you're another media brand, I'm not convinced that Instagram um, is a great place for you because people then think that they're experiencing all of their media in that channel. It's like, I'm getting my fill of, of Monocle. I get enough of it in there. And then are they bouncing then over to us for the deeper read? No. Um, and so we've, we've tried, Confect is on Instagram. Um, has it delivered, and I, I sort of, it was a big internal fight um, to say, you know, should we be there? Um, is this going to benefit it? Are we going to see an incredible bump in, um, in, in subscribers, et cetera? Hasn't, hasn't happened. Um, incremental, um, it's okay to be there, but is it transformational? No, and listen, you know, Met is a competitor. Um, you know, ultimately, they're there for the same ad dollars that we're after as well and the same eyeballs. So I, I don't want to, you know, I'm small, you know, we're tiny as a business, um, but I, whatever I can do not to facilitate them devouring uh, and killing off another regional newspaper, um, I want to make sure that, um, that, that we're somehow not aiding and, and abetting that. But of course, um, yeah, we, um, I'm, and maybe this is why we're also in Asia as well and focusing on Asia. Because if we did the same event, um, or, you know, let's say if it was a purely monocle event in London or in Frankfurt, you would see that yeah, the core of the room is going to be 40 to early 50s. Um, but if we do the same event in Bangkok uh, or Singapore, we're definitely sort of 12 to 15 years younger. I mean, you see that, uh, particularly with our Asian readers, um, that next generation of, you know, um, young Thai or young Indonesian entrepreneurs. I think back to like events we've done in Jakarta are very young. Um, so I think also we look at maybe the youth component as well. Um, there is an audience that we want to, uh, to bolster and, and reach here and hopefully that will globally balance out our numbers. Uh, so you say you don't have a big presence on Instagram. Is, is Monocle on TikTok at no. all? No. no. I mean, not that I know, but. Um. <laughs> um, and a. Thanks very much, Jen. Uh, Enda Curran, Bloomberg News. I just wonder, Tyler, how important is Twitter for distribution and promotion of your products? Thank you. Um, so, not very. Um, so we we are on Twitter mostly uh, for for the purposes of radio. So we don't engage on Twitter. Um, so you know, we, you know, if you want to um, post something or be rude, you're not going to hear back from us. Um, we you know we don't want to be. So what we do is it's more to say that, um, you know, the foreign minister of, um, of Finland uh, you know, just appeared, uh, you know, catch up with it on The Globalist. So it's, it's really almost using it in quite a clunky way, um, purely to, to push, uh, I would say mo primarily pushing content, um, main interviews, etc., around radio, uh, but we're not using it as... Yeah, as an active place to, to have a discussion. You know, I always say that you know, our, I still maintain our social medias um, an event with a glass of wine um, rather than uh, trying to be too digitally engaged. I mean, I'm being, uh, you know, obviously it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit broader than that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess a lot of our investment is, um, when we speak purely of our, of our own events, is, is getting out and being amongst our audience. And yeah, it's something that just strikes me as well. It's interesting when you, when you see this new surge of a lot of new media brands, I think, that come out there. I'm always amazed how little there is in the way of provenance. So many new brands forget about the power of the masthead. Um, and you actually get down page, and it's like, okay, you know, uh, you know get contact. And you just got a contact box and form there. But I don't know, are they based, you know, where are they based? Are they based in KL? Um, is this a, are they based in Abu Dhabi? Are they sitting in Athens? I have no idea you know, where this whole thing comes together, what its, what its provenance is. And one thing that, you know, Naomi and all of our editors will know this, everybody's email is on the masthead. Uh, we're incredibly easy to find. Um, and yeah, I would say 90% of the time, you're gonna get a response from us. Uh, so if you have something to say, um, yeah, let's, let's have a conversation and, and a discussion about it. But it doesn't have to be in a broader public forum. So that's just a bit of our house, house policy. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, Lee? Oh, sorry. Let's go over here first. I always, never, I always forget to look over, uh, over here in the corner. Okay, yeah, please go ahead. 
Sorry, what's your name, sir? Bianca Lee, I'm a student. Um, you talked about how there's this gender breakdown of subscribers. Have you ever looked at the socioeconomic um, breakdown of subscribers and how does that, um, how do you see that relate to your role as a lifestyle and luxury news outlet um, and is there any effort to kind of include a different um, audience because of that? So when you say different audience, what do you mean by that? Um, well, I guess first about your the socioeconomic breakdown of the people um, who read or purchase the magazine and whether you want to expand to like a broader audience in based on the socio sure. social. Um, so of course, absolutely, we, we're, we're very focused um, whenever we do um, a readership, a listenership um, survey, we are you know, always asking people's travel patterns, how much are they out in the world, uh, how do you fly, um, are you front of the plane, middle of the plane, back of the plane, are you traveling for business? Um, we're asking, of course, household income, et cetera. So, and that's very important. Um, you know, if, if I'm having a conversation with um, Deutsche Bank, uh, it's gonna be one of the first questions that they wanna know, especially if you're talking, you know, if, if, it, if it's a campaign around private wealth, they wanna make sure, obviously, we have an audience that, uh, that has, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, income to, to invest and deploy with them as, as a bank. So it's a huge part of what we do. I would also say that we, we do index uh, very high. I mean, you know, even I mean, compared to, I mean, I, we don't do the research. It's a, it's another agency that does it. But I think we're probably amongst the highest in the world when we look at the pan regional titles in terms of, um, of of household income. But that's great, and it's fine to do that. But again, I come back to uh, to the power of actually being around our audience um, and and just talking to people, listening to their stories, and making sure that all of my colleagues are doing the same. So again, um, it's one thing for you to sort of fill out a box and say that you make between 750 and, and, and a million Swiss francs a year, um, but it still doesn't you know, add enough layers. So that is, I think, one of the reasons why we, we try to engage. Now, to, to a broader audience, um, I would say, you know, I, want as many, I want to expose our title and our ideas to as many people as possible, but um, at the same time, we have to stay very focused. Um, and we know that we're able to do the journalism that we do, that we're able to, uh, I think, carry out and build a brand that we do um, because, because of the quality um, of the audience uh, that, that we have. But I guess Confect is a good example of it, let's say, broadening it out to a female audience um, as well. We saw that there was an opportunity there revenue-wise, there was an opportunity, rep I mean, I would say interest-wise um, as well to build our base. And I think to Genevieve's question, you know, I would say thinking about market in terms of regions, um, and and I would say taste within regions. That is probably more of an opportunity. So thinking about geography. Uh, was there anyone in the veranda area who had a question? All right, let's finish with finish with Lee then. Um, thank you, Tyler, for such a fantastically dynamic presentation. I'm Lee Williamson, I'm from Tatler Asia, I'm also on the board here at the FCC. Um, I wanna pick up on one comment you made when you said that the UK is your most important market after the US. Um, but if I heard you correctly, you, you then went on to say that Switzerland and France are your biggest revenue drivers. So if revenue isn't the key parameter you're looking at when you're deciding what are your most important markets, as a global brand, what are those parameters you're looking at when you decide these are our most important markets? Yeah, I guess there's, there's, there's the divide between um, you know, audience and, and, and where, where are your readers. Um, and of course, there's going to be a, a carryover point. So let's say if we, if we use Switzerland as, as a good example, um, yes, you know, whether it is UBS or, it, it's, or it's Rolex or it's Swiss Tourism or it's the airline, again, probably for them, America is an important market. So they, they, they want to reach it. And we have to, we have to be prominent in that market. Um, but then likewise, I also have to make sure that if, you know, if you're working for uh, the Swatch Group um, and you fly through Zurich or Geneva Airport, it's also you know, essential that you know, we are present, uh, that, that you're, you're, you see us on newsstand, uh, that we're part of also the conversation within Switzerland um, as well. So I'd say there's, there's much more of a, a commercial necessity to 
ensure that we're, we're keeping our clients happy, aware, um, and they see our presence within their, their home markets. But then also then they want to make sure that you're reaching you know, the, sa the same places you know, around the world which are essential to them. And obviously for us, um, U.S. Is, um, you know, is incredibly important to us. And, it's, and you know, we should probably confront this one. I'm surprised it hasn't come up yet. Um, but, you know, China is not a market for us um, for, for many obvious reasons. India is not a market for us either. Um, and some brands you know, then choose not to, not to spend with us. Oh, if you can't deliver China, then you know, we're, we're, going to go, we're going to go somewhere else. If you can't deliver India for us, um, because it's core strategy, we might, we might go somewhere else. Um, but we also choose not to be in those markets for, yeah, I mean, obviously a, a, few, um, a few reasons I think we can all figure out in the room. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for being here today. And uh, I know we need to uh, announce some winners here. Yes, yes. What was the verdict? Um, well, I, I just, you know, I, I, like, I like where Genevieve's thinking is going. So, uh, so there's a, Jen, there's a treat for you. Um, I, think, I, think Dor I think, Dorothy, your, your question was, um, was interesting, um, an interesting one. I think just the tension that we have as, as media owners um, and, and at the same time, the tension we have with our own readers and our own staff um, and also our partners and, and where, do we, you know, where do we go out in the world, um, who do we work with, who do we not work with, how do we have um, uh, an, an honest um, uh, dialogue. Um, so I, 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 I thought that was a great question. Um, and, and sorry, the gentleman from Bloomberg, I didn't, I didn't get your, uh, your first name, but I just thought your question about Twitter and how to engage, not engage, how to use it uh, was, was interesting. So um, three treats for all of you um, up here. And if anyone's got questions, I'll, of course, I'm around. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you again. And I was just going to say, there's a book signing, yeah. Yes, um, you're, you're available to sign Yeah, books. so we're, yeah, we've got our new books over there if anyone wants to sign. Harry's also got a subscription offer as well, etc. So I'll be over there answering questions, signing books if you'd like. Yes, and we have a, a gift for you as well. Okay. So thank you again. Thank you.